going live soon. <laughs> Hopefully. Oh, you yeah, have the lights on. Good. That's a good thing. Okay. Oh, gotta turn my phone on silent. And... Tweeting, etc. For you, for people who just are joining me now, thanks for being here a minute early. I told myself I'd get in my seat, you know, give myself 10 minutes to work out some stuff and make sure everything's working, and of course that didn't happen, but we're gonna try to, you know, have a good stream. It's my first solo stream, so I'm a little bit nervous about that, but we will see how it goes. I've got a whole plan. I have notes, like usual, on my prep. I enjoy the prep, and I hope to cover a few things that people will find helpful and and or educational or entertaining or just glad you came basically that's that's the that's the hope and then we get started real soon make sure everything looks good does everything look okay and okay yeah looks like looks like it's on and get the chat back. Great. Hello, everyone. Hello, the Diavor. Hello, Michael Darkwolf. Hello, Azizo Shapir. Oh, thank you for setting an alarm. That's awesome. Thank you. Oh, it means a lot. It means a lot that people would come out to see this. Just, I'm going to give it a few more minutes for people to kind of trickle in. And I plan on going for about an hour. We'll see where it goes and how it takes us, where it takes us. Um, Always with art, you always want to spend more time with it and figure it out. And I've got a lot I want to cover before we actually even get to the art. And I'm going to try to get through that not too fast, but at a reason a reasonable um, rate so that we're not uh, just stuck doing that, that stuff, which I think is fun. I could talk for hours about EGA and the techniques and show a few game examples, things like that. But uh, yeah, we're, we're, I said uh, we'd be doing some art, so I'm going to get there. Just a matter of how far along we're going to get. Hello, Cami Last. Thanks for coming, too. Uh, you're awesome. And yeah, we do have some Space Quest screens I'm going to share, too, uh, as sterling examples of, of EGA. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just learning. I'm starting to learn. Hello, Pascal. Thanks for coming in. Oh, you know what? I have to I have to tweet to the Classic Gamers Guild that I'm live. That's just something I forgot to do last time. I like to say I'll try to make every mistake once, but I won't I'll try not to repeat them. So let's see. Let us see. Oh, great. It says test stream still <laughs> um, in the stream description. So already that's um, an oops. Can I change that right now? Uh, <laughs> okay. Let's try to change that. Stream information. Hello, the Deluxe Tux. Hello, Paulo. Thank you for coming. Yeah, I. Oh, let's see if I can. T can I change the stream title midstream? And is that going to work? Mm hmm. Okay, I'm gonna try to change that. See if that does anything. Um, that's a mistake I haven't made yet. So, woo, right? Games. Uh oh, I don't know what the category. Let's forget the category. Let's just try to fix that. Okay. Yes, I've got the stream manager got, uh, on. Hello, Con Games. Yes. <laughs> thanks for coming thanks for coming live and yeah for people who I mean I don't, don't know why I'm telling you guys but 
For the people who can't make it live, I will be posting my live streams on YouTube. There are already a few up there, and uh, and so don't worry about ever having to miss or, or duck out early or anything like that. It'll all be up um, for people to come see. Okay. Okay. Cool. So I'm gonna get started in like just another minute. Give us get, give everyone like a good five to you know to park their cars and, and you know get in the door. Hello Anna, thanks for coming. Hello Proto Mail and Eden Waith, of course. Thank you so much. Yes, more pixel drawing goodness. I did do a test stream on Saturday. Uh, that's about 23 minutes long. Showing kind of what I'm doing here, but I, I I didn't show the techniques and tips and classic game examples. And I'm actually thinking at the end of this stream, going back and showing you guys some of the process, uh, some of the progress I made on that last um, EGA demo piece that I started for the test stream. So if maybe if we have time, we'll do that too. Hi, Peevish Dave. Hi, Classic Gamers Guild. Great to see you again. I posted uh, the stream live on Classic Gamers Guild with admin approval, so I think I'm I think I'm safe. And I hope the stream information got updated. Um, if anyone could confirm that, that would be awesome. But uh, I'll leave it for now. Great. Uh, the 32-bit kid. Awesome. Thanks Thanks for coming by, too. I'm, I'm recognizing a lot of people. So I'm, I'm so excited about that. Okay, so it's 8.05. Um, <laughs> my, my opinion of the Dagger of Amon-Ra. The, my opinion of uh, the Deluxe Tux of the Dagger of Amon-Ra is that game's amazing. The soundtrack is probably the best part about it. But I, I do love that game. It's, it's wonderful. I love Egyptology as well. When I was in uh, London for Adventure X, um, I got to see, you know, the British Museum and I got to see the Rosetta Stone and all that. And that was a huge deal for me. And I'm not going to say that it wasn't because I like the, the Dagger of Amon-Ra. That definitely helped a lot. Um, to see the Rosetta Stone was just incredible in person. Adventure X, unfortunately, got cancelled this year. So um, it's going to be a no-go. But if anyone, anyone who loves adventure games, it's like the it's it's the conference to go to. You get people from all over Europe. I got to meet all all kinds of people who love adventure games from all over the place. And it was a really it was the best experience. I have to say, out of all the conferences I've been to, it's probably the best one for me anyway. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so I unfortunately uh, the way I structured this is I I'm going to show the trailer real quick for people who aren't familiar with the game, but I, I get a feeling that a lot of people in chat are pretty familiar with the game. But anyway, here's here's the um, here's the trailer. Uh, and why is it not playing? Okay, yeah, it just... There it goes. Yeah, so um, the Crimson Diamond is an EGA, as, as we see, 16 color palette, text parser adventure game made in that kind of Sierra of like the late 80s, early 90s. Got, you know, like your Conquest of Camelot, the Colonel's Bequest especially. A lot of those good old uh, Sierra SCI EGA games. So that was my major inspiration for the game. And uh, it's set in Canada in 1914. And it is a classic kind of Agatha Christie style murder mystery um, type, of, type of thing. And it has a lot of stuff that I love and find interesting, like local history, um, it's got uh, mineralogy, geology, and uh, it's a cozy mystery type of thing. So it's basically a lot of um, my what I love and I love to learn about anyway. Just all kind of I kind of put it all together in one thing and, and I'm making it into a game. So that's what that is. In case you guys um, are not familiar, there is the CrimsonDiamond.com is the website, and uh, on there you got like there's links for everything like YouTube channel and Twitch and. Facebook fan page, all, all the all that stuff. There is um, there is a demo on Steam. Um, thanks to Eden Waith, who is in the chat. Uh, there's a PC version and a Mac version of the demo. And the Mac port is a is a courtesy of Eden Waith, who has also done StairQuest and another game. Yes, thanks, Roberta. Hi, Roberta. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, and also it's on itch.io, Mac and PC version as well. So the, the demo is free. It's the first chapter of the game. And uh, yeah, if you guys could check it out, let me know what you think. That would be really super, super helpful, super awesome. <laughs> oh, thanks to the deluxe uh, tax. I'll take I'll take every compliment about the art for sure. Oh, oh, hi, Jen. Yeah, my Aziza is Jen. Okay, so next. So Dan, on our last uh, music 
uh, it's a live stream. Dan Polikar is my musician that's working on the game. We sort of showed a bit of a preview of what we're going to be doing today. And that is this little step-by-step -step piece that, that I, I kind of put together to show what that process is like for me when I'm building, at least for the exteriors, um, for the game. The interior art for the game is done a little bit differently. The process is a little bit different. Uh, I might do that in a, like a future stream. But for the most part, we'll be discussing the techniques that are involved in building this style, this style of, of piece. Okay, and so what we're going to do is um, we're going to get started on uh, the Photoshop. Oh, you know, yeah, and I'm going to show some examples of, uh, of other games that are EGA. I'm just, just going to check my notes and make sure I'm not missing anything yet. Oh yeah, this is a fun thing. So I was on, um, I was mentioned on the Canadian Game Devs podcast, and uh, they were saying that they were looking up what EGA text parser was, and when they Googled EGA text parser, my my game was the first result to come up. So I, I was pretty happy about that, and because I always call it that whenever I explain it, and just the fact that my my um, the Crimson Diamond came up first in that result when they Googled it was super cool to hear. I just want to check the chat. Real quick. Cool. Okay. So we're going to go into Photoshop. I'm going to start in um, some music. So this music is um, not too loud, I hope. Yeah. Uh, if, it, if the music's too loud, just let me know and I can control that. And the music is from the Great Canadian Tune Book, which is another one of my major inspirations for the game. And that is a bunch of MIDI Canadian folk tunes. Um, that uh, that I love, and they're all so it kind of gives you that same feel of the music that Dan's making for the game. Although uh, now I'm getting a, all original music, which is kind of amazing. Okay, so let's look uh, at some of the color stuff. Uh, I'm going to try to keep track of chat as much as possible, but um, I'm going to try to get through this too. So here is the EGA color palette. I'm going to rotate it just so it can fit over to the side. This is, this is the 16 colors that we're talking about. This is it. This is all you get. And, and I'm one of those people that says, do you actually need more than this? That's all you need, right? You can make anything with these 16 colors. Uh, and with 320 by 200 pixels, you, you can make anything with this. This is magical. Okay, so I'm going to show you some examples of other games. On Twitter, I was asking people about um, games that they like, that, that, what they consider the best EGA art. And um, I was happy to, to see that a lot of the stuff I picked was stuff that other people had already also mentioned. And I'll just take these all in order here. This first screen is <laughs> Wizardry 6. And, and it was mentioned in Twitter, and I did have it in my collection before um, I got started um, with my prep. And this is, this is kind of like peak EGA in terms of what they were doing with the, with, with the engine. Oh, not with the engine, with the graphical adapter it is it has a lot of levels of, of priorities of things going on you can see they were smart in keeping that background relatively like only a few colors like in tone the bright the colors are only really in the middle so they kind of, they really stand out nicely yes battle chess eating weight that's there hello dna beast the sacred 16 yeah who needs pastel with that with that 16 and yet yeah, dithering which i saw someone mentioned in the chat that's all you need right so you see a little bit of dithering actually in this guy's chainmail helm but we'll talk about that like, uh, like way later, I think, um, when we get into technique. But that's just that's a classic, of course, and, and well loved. Um, Brenda Romero worked on that, and as it happens, Dan Policar is also working with Brenda Romero and John Romero on Empire of Sin. So there we go. It's kind of awesome that um, I've got like a second degree of separation between um, this game and my game. Yes, that's what it's called, the checkerboard. We'll get into the checkerboard. This is Wasteland. Brian Fargo. Brian Fargo. I, I, kind of, I sometimes confuse Brian Fargo and Brian Moriarty. I'm so sorry. but um, Yeah, so we've got um, Wasteland. Oh yeah, so I want to give credit where credit is due. Wizardry 6. Um, the artists there were Chris Appel, Appel Renata Dolnik, Suzanne Schelling. I can't read my own writing. I'm so sorry. And Paul McCall. Uh, sometimes there's like a, a bunch of people and I, I don't know them all. Sometimes there's only a few, but I'll try to name people out as I see it. Okay. Yes. Uh, let's see. Um, Eric Chahi's Future Wars um, is not technically 
uh, EG, I think it might be an Amiga game, and I think the palette is a little bit different. Okay, Wasteland. Uh, the artist here was uh, Todd J. Canast Camasta. Oh my gosh, I gotta write this better next time. Bruce Schlickburn. It's classic. And, and you know, it, it, it does say post apocalyptic, uh, post apocalyptic, I think, pretty well. People think post apocalyptic can't be super bright, but I actually think this acidic kind of color is, is really compelling. Next here's something that I remember fondly from my childhood. Oops, oh no. This is Super Solvers Outnumbered. Great piece of EGA, you can see. Uh, it depends that this this technique here, he's uh, the sprite is outlined to make it stand out from the background, and that isn't like that is probably more typical of action games than adventure games that we're used to. But yeah, there's there's some outlining going on here. Beautiful game. Super Solvers Outnumbered, Tim Dunn, and others. This is, yeah, I know, isn't it funny? Because when I think back to my childhood about EGA and, and what games were EGA, I suddenly realized I actually played a lot of stuff that was EGA without even really realizing it at the time. Oh, I unfortunately, uh, Michael Darkwolf, I only had this one, but I feel like I want to go back and play the other ones. This is just beautiful. Yes. Uh, I remember seeing the ads for these in magazines too, Proto Melf. Next, this is something that was in Benj Edwards' um, 35th anniversary of EGA PC Gamer article. This is SimCity. And I, it's beautiful. This is beautiful the way that this is done here. You can see that he's using um, Will Wright, uh, of course. Uh, Don Bayless, Scott Martindale. You can see how the brown is predominantly used for the background to keep everything from getting confused. There is a bit of brown in some of these, like the factories, but it's used very sparingly. Um, that's something, you know, this is actually, I don't know if this is technically EGA here, but it would have been. It's just the, the colors are a bit weird in this in this file. Yeah, SimCity, this is the one I remember very fondly, and uh, this is the one that I think a lot of people, were when they were introduced to SimCity for the first time, this is the one that we, you know, a lot of people had, this DOS version here. Next we have one that, I, again, I, I love this one so much, and it's interesting to think of this as EGA because... Um, it's it's extremely limited. It's even using fewer colors in the EGA color palette. This is Rampage. This is the DOS version of Rampage, um, which is one of my favorite games. They made one of those small versions of Rampage, like that little mini version um, you can buy at Walmart with Oregon Trail and stuff like that. And I love it. And it's funny because when you only use a, like a small portion of the EGA color palette, it suddenly doesn't look like EGA, but it's still super crisp and it's still super beautiful. Um, and uh, you can see it's used to great effect in, in, the, in these cases. And it might be using more colors. You're right. When I'm just I'm just looking at right now, as I was saying that the Divor, uh, I'm looking at the little the little uh, dynamite here and uh, Lizzie's eyes, and there is some red in here. It's just they very they don't use it very much. So when I look at the color palette, um, yeah, the numbers are blue. You got a little bit of red. You got a little bit of pink in these little army guys, right? It's very used so sparingly, uh, but yeah, it's it's used to great effect. Uh, next, this is something I want to talk about. I'm really excited to share this one. No one mentioned mentioned Metal Mutant um, on Twitter, but this this is another example of a great limited color palette DOS game. And I did play this one, and although I did play the the v, it in VGA, not EGA, but you can see how limited the colors are here. But what they're doing is. They're keeping it very specific, like the high contrast areas, the black is in the foreground and everything else is kind of pushed back because the darkest color there is the dark gray. This is a great game. You, you can kind of morph on the fly between this little, this dinosaur guy, a robot and, and a tank with tank traits. Paulo remembers this one. This game is amazing. It's beautiful. Like, yeah, it's beautiful. This is Metal Mutants. Metal Mutants was Jean-Christophe Charté. Uh, he did a fantastic job. It's just, it's gorgeous. Uh, and of course, I meant, forgot to mention, uh, Rampage was Warwick Holfield did the Rampage art for the DOS version. This is, oh, it's so beautiful. Okay, next. Next, of course, Loom was a fan favorite. I got mentioned a lot on Twitter when I when I asked my question. Uh, this is, of course, this is Mark Ferrari, among others. Mark Ferrari did The Secret of Monkey Island. He did Loom, among other things. Oh, it's gorgeous. Um, we're doing a, sort of an exterior forest scene today, so I wanted to show a, what you know what was capable, what, what was achieved with the, this very specific way this forest was lit to make it look mysterious 
and, and kind of a bit spooky and magical. Yeah, Ferrari is incredible. And Gary Winnick, yes, Roberto, but Gary Winnick as well. And of course the music is completely beyond reproach. So this is, you can see, this is a nice, like a nice use of um, the dithering for adding depth to, to the piece. And then what we have here with this big tree in the front, which is something I like to do a lot, um, is um, is scale. So you've got a big tree in the front, smaller trees in the back, so naturally you get you get depth from that whole um, effect. Hello, Satchel the Diamond Dog. Uh, Loom was the first Lucas game to use dithering. Oh, uh, it's... It was, yeah, I, I, I can say no more. The only thing I will say is that it's a kind of a pity how, how hard it is to get um, a good EG version of Loom just on the commercial market nowadays. And so it's kind of hard to find um, like non-lossy uh, versions of the, the screenshots. Okay, next we have Duke Nukem, which is another classic Apogee. Duke Nukem... Mm. Duke Nukem, Ellen, H. Bloom the Third, George Broussard, and James Norwood. Another, you know, this is this this whole uh, idea of the the heads up display or whatever this is. Nice, simple color only in the middle. Classic. I'll go through a few more. So, okay, this is something funny because I, I was such a PC kid that a lot of the games that I remember playing um, that were even like console games, I had played the EGA DOS version of those console games. So what we have here is we have Double Dragon. <laughs> we should have stuck with that art style for Duke Nukem Forever. Oh my goodness. I mean, this I would prefer that. But this is EGA Double Dragon, and this is the one I remember playing a lot. Uh, and uh, it just it worked for me. I, I didn't actually know about the console stuff until much later. Just a few more. Battle Chess. Yeah, Eden Wraith, here's the Battle Chess. Here's another example of a game using a limited version of the EGA palette to great effect. A Double Dragon DNA beast it says uh, Double Dragon looks good in CGA. <laughs> and Porto Mel, a, do a bo what is his name again? A, a Bobo. I always want to call him Adobe. A Bobo looks sad in EGA. Yeah, Battle Chess. This is an incredible game. This is another game where I didn't think of it as EGA until I took a second look at it um, because of the fact it's not using the full rainbow of that EGA. So we can even see that using EGA, um, even when you're not using that full color palette, you can still achieve achieve so much. And I, you know what, con games, I don't know what the benefit was beyond the artistic of um, using not the full palette. Um, they might have used the full more of the palette in maybe menus or something. I don't actually. I, I can't remember. Um, it's a possibility because I guess you could cycle the colors you use per room or whatever. But um, I'm not sure. It might might have just been artistic. Unfortunately, I don't know much about the technical part, the technical side of this stuff. I, I'm I'm sort of an artist first, so I approached EGA from an artist standpoint, which is the way it looks and not really really how how it actually works. Commander Keen, Commander Keen Five. Um, Another classic, this was um, very messy handwriting. Adrian Carmack did the keen, and this is wonderful. A few more. Oh, and last but not least, certainly, this is the Colonel's Bequest, of course. Doug Herring. Uh, and I don't know, this is, this is the reason probably why the Crimson Diamond exists as a pro project at all. It is my favorite. It's my favorite EGA art. It's what I looked at when I was developing the art for the Crimson Diamond. And we will see other examples of game art uh, later, because um, I have other examples. But um, that, I'm just gonna, yeah, Doug Herring, he's a mass he is and was a master, and uh, nothing but uh, admiration. <laughs> Laura, watch out for the flappers. Yeah, Mark is insane, and Doug Seems to take that and add a pinch of awesome. He does. The light, the lighting is just, just gorgeous. So going back to this EJ color palette, we can see that so much can be achieved with just the 16, and sometimes even fewer than the 16. Um, and the thing is with um, with EGA is you can't. Uh, there's no kind of transparencies that you can lay down in EGA. You, when you make a shadow, you don't. You can't just throw on like a gray transparency and call it a shadow. You actually have to consider everything that you're doing because you don't get any other tricks besides what you have, uh, you know, the colors you have here. 
Uh, okay, so what I'm going to show you actually is I'm going to show you a different way to organize the EGA color palette um, that isn't just you know one beside the other, and it is it's this way. And if it would open, okay, there we go. So this is another way to look at the EGA color palette, and when you line it up like this, you can kind of see. Sure, there's a dark and a light version of the colors, right? So. You can kind of say, well, this color, this is a red, but that red and shadow would be this color. Or, you know, this is the yellow and then etc. So we can kind of look at it like that. Yes, the Diavoir, that's how I have Yeah, that's how it's, it, it makes sense to have the colors organized when you're thinking about light and shadow. But EGA is kind of capable of doing so much more than this. And this is not, this is, this is not, it's like a cold, hard rule either, as, as I'll show in a few of the next um, examples. Yeah, the yellowest to brown. This is, it's just, you know what, I'm going to just say it is the weirdest color palette. There are four colors of blue and like one yellow, basically. It's very strange, but I, 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 do, I do have, you know, the biggest soft spot for it. So going into shadow, I've only got, I've got, I've got a lot of examples. I'm just going to go through these really quickly. So I would say that, uh, yeah, the Space Quest has some amazing um, examples of light and shadow. This one in particular is interesting because it's showing how to do kind of like a rounded uh, volume, right? Like a cylinder. And you're going to need, you know, this is still using this color palette, but what it's doing is it's giving you different colors, different layers of, like there's dithering, then there's not dithering, etc. There's there's a lot going on here to give that illusion. According to hardware, I think there is like an intensity bit which is flipped to go from low color to high color. I believe it. And most notably, the lack of peach skin tone. Yes, the skin tone is something that uh, I will get into possibly in a future stream. It's too much to cover here. I already see that we're at 8.26 p.m. and I haven't even started drawing. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to cover like the skin tone issue um, on a future stream. Okay, so here's another example. This is, look, this is this is a great example of, in Space Quest 3, of Light and Shadow, where it's kind of done in, a, in an unexpected way. There's brown, but the other side of that brown is this weird green. Works, and uh, and it shows how inventive you can get with these beautiful alien landscapes. Um, Thirty-two bit kid actually has a Twitter where he does a breakdown of um, how these are drawn with uh, SCI editor and the steps and everything, and it's very educational. Here's another example. So yeah, we have the light green here with the dark green, but the darkest part of the shadow, defining the shape in the shadowed area, is this dark blue, and that's a great example of the way light and shadow can be done in EGA. And when you look at also, I like also we can see here, uh, uh, yeah, some of these I couldn't really get as a ping, so this is just really blurry. But if you look closely in this light and shadow here, you can see this is the lightest area. You've got this shadow being cast by this shape, and then the shadow of the dune, when it crosses the shadow of the shape, gets darker. And that's a really cool trick to give you the feeling of a shadow on top of a shadow. When you you know you can't actually you do as I said transparencies in this in this palette you make this illusion and this illusion is a lot of where the magic is you know, for EGA for me. The hot pink is a hard the Diavor to to use. Uh, I have a hard time. Um, yeah, I don't know if I use that hot pink very much. I have a hard time with the yellow because the yellow is so bright that I don't I only use it for accents. Another example, this is, a, this is a more straightforward example of, um, you know, the light color is used here and then the shadow is used here. The light um, magenta, dark magenta, light coral, dark coral, etc. A bit more straightforward than the other one, but still there's a lot of tricks. And Camulus, this is the one we talked about on Twitter, isn't it? The asteroid base. This, it's so simple, it's so effective. Um, the yellow accents look great on wood. I, I actually use the yellow for just like gold, brass, and metal. Um, for wood, I use sort of the the light, the light red on the brown. Okay, so this is great. This is another example of the shadow, and the shadow doesn't necessarily have to be the darker color, the darker version of a color, because the lightest side of the asteroid base is dark, dark green. So what what color do we use for that other side, the shadow side? And this blue is, is a fantastic, very spacey color that, that, that works. So it's in these decisions that aren't the most straightforward is where we find a lot of the really cool stuff. Uh, and I'm trying to get through. Yeah, so here's another here's an example of another way for that illusion to work. So again, this is Space Quest. This is Space Quest 2. And what we have with Space Quest 2 
is you can see that there's a pattern on the ground here. You've got sand. And there's like little sand, little pebble particles. Oh, hey, Dr. Mikachu, how are you doing? Good luck with the game launch. I can't, I can't wait to play it. Code Romantic. Um, I'm, I actually am learning programming from your game because I'm such a, a novice programmer. So um, Code Romantic is, is a great way to do that in a sort of like a visual novel style p uh, game. So it's kind of awesome. Okay, so this um, this shadow here, you can see, okay, well, the dark version of the yellow is the brown. But you can see what's interesting is those par particles that they put in... Um, oh, of course, I know who. Oh, it's Mark Crow, right? Mark Crow. Mark Crow put in the darker version of the white is the, this uh, light gray. The dark version of the brown is the black. But we get this great illusion of a shadow because it's copying that same texture from the light side to the dark side. Um, great. Next, this is this is another fantastic example. This is obviously this is clearly Quest for Glory One, which is I know it's a game that's near and dear to a lot of us. And um, Quest for Glory One, Arturo Sinclair was the art director. There were there were a lot of people on this game, um, and for good reason because it's amazing looking. I would like to direct your attention. Um, mostly to this great banister shadow. And this great banister shadow is going to show you that illusion of sha of one shape of a shadow is being created by so many different colors here. We've got, if we really oh, if we really zoom in, we've got the dark purple as a shadow of the light purple, the d light red and the dark red. Um, we've got the green, dark green versus the light green, the blue, etc. Right, so you got that all the way through, and what happens is you just get this overall impression of a shadow on a wall when it's obviously just a fantastic illusion. Hey, Dan, good to see you. And yeah, there's so much here I could go into. Like, I actually really, this is a trick that I haven't used: is the dithering of the coral on the light pink. I think it's beautiful, and uh, it really kind of helps the magenta be less overpowering. It kind of breaks it up and kind of gives it a warmth which I kind of feel is a trick I should steal. Oh. <laughs> a little Cessna plane. Oh uh, yeah, great. It's just so many great details in, in this piece. Here's another example of, again, uh, oop, Space Quest with its fantastic shadow. Oh. It's just the, the use of the purple and the shadow here. I can't really say much more about it except that... Uh, I think EGA can achieve great things that... I don't know what the sampling was like on this. I don't know why it looks weird, but you get the idea. Um, Quest for Glory 2, the starting screen. This is a great example of what I was talking about before, about shadows on top of other shadows. And a gradation that can be created using the dithering and the different colors in a very clever way. Uh, DNA Beast has invisible spiders, spec... To a miser, it's restricted to blended e EG. Yeah, I gotta check that out. Um, I should probably write that down. Uh, <laughs> what's it called? <laughs> Invisible spiders. Dot com. Spec. Miser. Okay, great. This uh, no, this was Ken Nishiwe. It did the art. Well, uh, you know, he was the head artist the lead artist for Quest for Glory 2. Oh, thank you, Dan. Thank you for mentioning that from, to me, because I'm sure I won't be able to read what I just wrote. And thank you, Dan. Beast. Everyone, yeah, just more reinforcement so I, I actually get, get get the good information. But yeah, here's an example of, again, one of the cylinders with this, this great amount of dithering. That illusion that's created by how well that, that that's done is kind of amazing. And then you can see the shadow, and then here it is on top of this other shadow. The way the this is the darkest shadow, and uh, the way I really especially like the way that the to the the brick is done here. So the brick does have depth here, and then as you move out, get to it gets to be darker and darker. And that's fantastic. And that feather is really well done too. I have to say. Great. Um, this one is this an example of just a nice value study um, of uh, of a great EGA. Again, of course, this Ken Nishiwe, lead artist for Quest for Glory 2. And it's just, it's mostly cyan. This is an example of the way some people do night in uh, in games, in EGA games. And there's been, you know, a bunch of different solutions on how that, that it's done. And uh, this is one of them. One thing I do like to bring to your attention is this lighter area here for that door. 
Well, we can see the moon is back here, so there isn't really a reason I wouldn't think for this to be that bright. But it is that bright because it's, we're supposed to look at it. And so that's another consideration when you're making art for a game, is where you want players' eyes to go, where you want them to know where to walk, where to lead the eye, all those things. They don't necessarily have to be completely beholden to what would be realistic. Alright, moving on. 8.30, oh boy. This is going to go long, I can tell. Okay. Must be a multiple moon planet, Dan. You just might be right. And again, this is uh, Doug Herring with the, the, <laughs> the Crimson Diamond, the Colonel's Bequest. And here we get another great example of this: these long shadows that cover different colors, and how the, the same shape is created across different colors. It gives that feeling, that illusion of a shadow, when of course it is just a bunch of different colors on different pixels. All right. The color, yeah, the color is making your brain fill in the gaps, deluxe tux. The <laughs> long stream, long stream. Um, this, yeah, uh, Proto Mill, you're not, you're not alone when you're, you, I was just, I was basically scared of this entire game. Oh, and you, you know, what? another really cool detail is the way that these, these fences along the sides here are lit. You can see the light would hit that one, and then you've got this, the light on the top of this one, and it gives a really efficient sense of what the shapes are and where the lighting is. How do you decide what colors to pick? That's a really good uh, question, Dan. Um, basically, it you know it's a lot of trial and error, and and a lot of uh, different layers. And we can probably go into that when I start actually doing the art. Uh, Doctor Mikachu, so do you sketch out the scenes first to understand where the shadows go, and then convert it? No, actually, um, I just work directly on the screen, and so there's no unfortunately there's no concept art or anything fun. Um, one of the good things about VGA which was the next color uh, standard up, the 256 color palette, is the artist would actually do like actual full commercial paintings that would then get scanned in. Unfortunately, with, with EGA, a lot of this stuff was created either as black and white line drawings and then put into the computer or just straight on the screen. Well, for me, straight on the screen. So there's no cool, there's no cool concept art to like auction off or frame or sell or anything like that, um, unfortunately. Okay, so that comes to, I think I'm looking at my notes here. Uh, I think I've showed all that stuff. Okay, um, oh, I have a few more things to show. Um, wow, 8.36. Okay, 8.36. Let's keep going. Let's keep going, you guys. Um, you know what, and if, we, and if it comes to it, at 9, I'll show the piece I started at the at the test stream and I can show you the process of, of where that went just so people get that so they can see a piece of art had gotten made um, but I have a few things for depth okay there's only a few here that's good okay so uh, for depth um, this is more for um, like exterior shots so this is outside outdoors you want to give a feeling that the player is in a vast space where there's a lot you can see in the distance um, oh yes, Duvar, you're right about the concept cross stitch, because I will be doing crimson diamond cross stitching. That is, that's just um, I'm waiting for some Ida cloth that's black to come in the mail, pretty much. And the 32 bit kid, uh, Quest for Glory 2, was in a really tight dev window. It was like 10 months. Yeah, I know it was less than a year, which is insane to think about. Yeah, <laughs> I can't believe it either. Okay, so depth is something that we have to think about in exterior shots. To give the player sort of a sense of, of like I said, depth and environment. And so we can see here, this is, a, I'm sorry, this is such a blurry version of this screen, Quest for, uh, Space Quest 3, again, Mark Crow. Uh, we have um, the highest contrast area is in the middle, where which is where the player is, the player area. Um, and another thing about the illusion of the depth that's created in, in, in EGA games is that the player often doesn't actually move through this whole distance. So this this uh, Roger Sprite, we don't we're not going to see him walk all the way up to the, by the volcano here um, to see him scale up and down dynamically. And there's a really good reason why there there tends not to be um seem that seamless dynamic sprite scaling in EGA games. And I will show you why. I actually have this really nice little uh, sprite things I made to show what sprite scaling would look like. Uh, you can see um, Nancy's face gets a little funny as she gets dynamically scaled. It's not a good look. 
So this is why um, in EGA games, at least in my experience, we don't often let the player move all the way up to the front, all the way through the back with a lot of depth because uh, it just doesn't look right. But we do want to give the illusion that they are moving, that the area does have a lot of depth, even though it actually doesn't. Okay. Uh, okay. So there's that one. Here's another. This is a great example. Ken Nishiwa, again, lead artist, Quest for Glory 2. This is great because it's, it's a depth shot, but it's not an exterior shot. This... Uh, this is great. It moves off into the background, and what we can see here is the colors get fewer, the contrast gets less, and the shapes get smaller. So all these things are little tricks to make something look like it's going away in the distance. And it's good because we can see these these are the, the, the shelves that are closest to us. So we have a visual reference of, oh yeah, well here are shelves getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So it looks like this goes on forever. And although we know that, I don't think the hero can go much further than maybe this line of tile. But it's the magic of thinking that there is more beyond. And keep on laughing. Who doesn't love keep on laughing? Keep on is the guy. Alright, next. Oh, this is this is might be one of my favorites. Um, to showing into showing depth. This again, Mark Ferrari, A Secret of Monkey Island. And I look at this and and I just I don't even know what to say really. It's it's kind of perfect. Um. Oh, hi. Uh. Uh. Toma Kasatnav. Hey, some AG, uh, AGS games switched out manually to run distance views. Yeah, exactly. Instead of automatic scaling. So it's particularly in The Secret of Monkey Island, there are some parts where you'll actually see Guybrush, you know, you'll, you'll move him down something and then he'll get smaller and then he'll get smaller. But it was all kind of like hidden cuts in a way. You wouldn't see him do that as a smooth transition. Like he'd walk, but then he'd like walk around a corner. And then, then the sprite would become a different sprite and the, the player's not controlling it maybe. And he, that's just a smaller sprite that's animating. Um, and then, you know, he might switch out to something that's even smaller. And, and so that was the illusion of, of sprite scaling, but what they did instead was they had different sizes specifically that they were using, that they would go from that one to that one without a smooth transition. This the illusion of a smooth transition, because the smooth transition is kind of a disaster. Especially when you have a character like, um, like Eyebrush, where he's got eyes that are one pixel by one pixel, same as Nancy has one pixel by one pixel eyes. So any type of weird scaling is gonna, you know, make her eyes look really go nuts, basically. <laughs> Leap Light can't stand, keep on laughing. Yes, the old walking over the hill trick, DNA beast, exactly. Uh, here's another one. This is again Doug Herring, the Colonel's Bequest. I love this because it shows, yeah, that sense of scale and depth created by um, making less contrast and making the size bigger of the things to give that depth. And that beautiful, look at this blue shadow on this on this brown. It's so unexpected, but you know, I, I, I can't, I can't even, I don't know. There's no words. There's no words. And then even in this background, this is brown and blue, but you look at it from a distance and it just looks perfect. Yeah, the night in uh, Colonel's Bequest is amazing. Okay, moving on. Last one. This is um, this is Secret of Monkey Island. This is um, again Secret of Monkey Island. Mark Ferrari. Uh, just like this, the way that the the pier, the pier comes out, darker, and then the lighting on these flagstones. This is so much going on here that this is amazing, and I'm, and and even look at this the way this torch is done, where the light, how beautiful that transition is from black to the brightest brown part. It's beautiful. As I understand it, all those dithering areas are stored as a blended color and split into EGA colors on render DNA beast. Yeah, I think yeah, I think you got something there. Um, because when they were just moving on from VGA to EGA, EGA to VGA, um, yeah, they did want to have a version and sometimes those versions, the, the EGA version of the VGA games, didn't look that great because I kind of feel like it was an afterthought. Uh, and I'm looking at you, King's Quest V, and I think apparently Space Quest IV had a had a, an EGA version. Space Quest Historian kind of showed a bit of that. And uh, 
it, when you just do that straight conversion sometimes, sometimes it doesn't look that great. You kind of have to have someone go in and fix and adjust. Um, yes, King's Quest V is the best DNA beast. Thank you for um, agreeing with me. And Peevish Dave, how to make really great good stuff with a terrible palette. Um, you know, it's funny because I have uh, I know Mark Ferrari hated EGA, and I know Doug Herring also doesn't like EGA. Um, and for me, it's just all like f warm, fuzzy memories. Um, so I can understand where they were coming from, though, because for them, they were coming from a paint paint box, a real paint box, because they're all classically trained artists, of, of infinite colors. And then you tell them they can only work with these, and I can understand why they'd be upset. Okay, I'm going to start in on um, an actual piece now. It's only 844. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're going to start a new um, canvas, 320 by 200. Where we're starting. Here it is in all its glory. And uh, what I'm going to start with is I don't like starting with the plain white. I think the white is just really just too bright for my eye. And I know this this is an exterior um, screen, so I'm going to start with just the dark green. Actually, let's see. Um, okay, let's start a new layer. Actually, no, let's make the background layer that color. Okay. And the second thing I do after creating the 320 by 200 pixel um, canvas is I will actually take a sprite for a uh, size reference. Oh, we start with black, the Diavor? Um, yeah, I guess with Loom, they I imagine they probably start with, start with black. <laughs> yeah, they suffered to make EG enjoyable for you for years to come, Peevish Dave. You are correct. Because um, I have nothing but happy memories associated with it, because I guess it wasn't my job. Um, I've made it my job now. Okay, so we've got uh, Nancy. We've got her here. And just to give us a sense of what the scale is going to be like. And, you know, I'd name that layer like person or something, just so I keep her straight. And then we start another layer. Second thing I like to do is I like to establish where the horizon is. So this is going to be kind of essentially the, the limit of her walkable area. And anything else, um, anything above the horizon line will be kind of um, in the distance, and everything else will be in the foreground. So, you know, and, and, and I'm going to start getting really close and being really intense on the camera because I'm actually, I've got a Service Pro 2. And so the webcam is on the top of the Service Pro 2, and the screen is like right here, and I'm actually drawing directly on the screen with my stylus. So, that's why you're gonna start seeing me just staring intently. I'm not really staring at you guys. It's just this is just how it goes. So you know, let's put a line in there. Um, and next thing I would do is, well, okay, so you're gonna have a path that she's gonna be walking on, or like where are the, where are the directions that we're gonna have her be able to walk, and where we're not gonna have her walk. So let's see. Okay, dark mode forever. Yes. Um. I like to make curvy, I like to make curvy, um, paths. It's not bad, right? Let's turn that off. So I, I use a lot of magic wand tool to fill things in. It's not bad. Uh, the Diavor, uh, do you have any tips for not mixing the up the order on the pixel dither? I do not. Mine are a mess. I can, I can show you, um, I'll show, and you know, at, at around nine, I will cut to like I'll be like a cooking show, and I'll show you something that's already kind of half done, and then the f kind of half finished version of the half done thing, so that you guys get some idea. Because I don't think by nine I'll be anywhere close to doing anything at this point. But I will show you the layers in mine, and it's just no, it's a mess. And I've done like seventy of these backgrounds, maybe sixty of these backgrounds, and I still haven't got much better. Okay, so trees. Uh, you know. So we'll do that scale thing that I was talking about, right? So we're going to put, you know, this tree. Put a tree there. And then what you can do is, you know, over here, okay, well, it's going to be a smaller and thinner tree. And that, that's going to give us some kind of uh, scale, right? And then why don't we do like an evergreen tree? Here, maybe? Right, and maybe we can put a little 
Got some smaller ones over here. And uh, maybe one that's kind of in front of those two, those bunch. What color is the sky going to be? Good question. Well, it depends how far the sky goes. <sighs> is Nancy Photo me? I, you know, I should actually. Actually, I can't look back. I don't. I don't even know what the screen looks like right now. Okay, so now we kind of have a vague idea of um, of the sense of scale and distance. What's great about trees is it kind of almost doesn't matter um, when you have big things versus small things because trees can be really, really big. Uh, I, I know um, some people uh, sometimes people like to see outbuildings, so hey, why not? Let's put like a as Bob Ross would do. Put, let's put a happy little um, outbuilding. Like an, I don't know, an actual outhouse maybe. And because we're working so sketchy right now, just placing stuff, um, there's no problem with just going in there wholesale and just copying and pasting whole areas and just moving it over. And then just kind of fixing it. And then combining those things. No. Has it been the same song this whole time? Just as a matter of... A lot of the the, the songs on the Great Canadian Tune Book are very similar sounding. So I'm just going to take a peek. Is it only playing one song? I feel like it's been playing that song forever. What's going on? Well, let's, let's put something... Okay, I don't know why that's doing that. Anyway, let me know if this song persists forever. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, so you know what? I was gonna do like a little house or something. Let's put it back here. So, so simple layers. Oh yeah, I was gonna say I said outhouse, so that's a little, a little smaller. Let's put a little. Oh, you know what? This is why we need Nancy because this is gonna be huge, right? It's. <laughs> ah. All right, let's go. Let's backpedal. Nancy, how big would would an outhouse be? Okay. okay. Nancy's outhouse would be. I don't know. It probably would be smaller, but they have like usually they have that roof, I guess, and like a narrow. They usually have that like, crescent. I guess it's to let light in, or like smell out, or something. Okay. And then the little outhouse that could. <laughs> it's an outhouse for the three bears. Cool. Is it going to be a jolly red outhouse? Um. Okay. At, okay. At um. At eight fifty-five. I will um, show the progress of the test stream piece that if you guys ever want to watch the, that piece from beginning to whatever, um, I, you, you can see that. Uh, and then where I take it from there with the dithering, because I haven't even covered dithering yet. Um, I will do that as soon as I f finish doing a bit more of this. Mm. Oh, you know what? I kind of decided that the light was coming from this way. So, I 
Okay. Oh, quarantine with no booze. Okay. Um. Yeah, as soon as um, I'm going to start hitting this with some some dithering soon, just so you guys can see what the heck that would look like. So this is an example of a continuation of a pattern to give the illusion of light. And yet we'll get to dithering. But first I will show what uh, what kind of I ended up with at the other... Um, for people who are on a schedule... Um, for, uh, for people who are on a schedule, uh, I will show... So this is the piece that I kind of worked on um, on the test stream, and this is the level of uh, completion I think I had on it. Either this, or it could have even been here. You can see how I didn't start with Nancy on the screen, and that's why this thing looks ridiculous. But uh, when I did put her in there, um, I you know, won't start looking ridiculous. Anyway, so from here... Um, you can see I've added some layers and stuff. So let's get through some of this. So here is sort of a... We, we're getting more into creating some of that depth in the back. We've got some trees in the far, far, far distance that are just the dark blue. We've got some medium distance trees that are that dark cyan and dark gray. And uh, what else do we have here? Then we start getting in cleaning some stuff up and putting some texture on the ground. This is all like just stuff. You can see I start putting in. I mean, this is not really a level of completion where I would start doing this necessarily, but um, it's good to see all the steps, even if it's kind of half finished. I can always go back and fix everything. Um, and you know, we start going in with some of this, like knocking some of that stuff back more. Alouetta. Okay. Getting there. You can see how even like this dithering pass of the dark green, um, how it's affecting these bushes to the left. How it's such a subtle change, but they just get green. They get this look of green. And what that is, is um, this look. So what it is, is it goes on top of the dark cyan, and then this part goes on top of the light cyan. And what it gives is this weird, like, optical illusion of another color, because those two colors are so close together in contrast. The music repeat button. Am I, is there a music repeat button? Do I have playback? How am I on? Is it on? Oh, you know what? You're right. Aha! Thank you, Dr. Mikachu. Let's move on to another track. I'm so sorry. I. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. And then what we have is just more moving in with some of the fixing. So this is the problem with the, some of the dithering passes. So I've got a couple different dithering passes for the black because some of the, the way the layers are arranged. So you can see it's like, it's a mess, the Diavor. It's a complete mess. Um, the way this all gets done. Oh yeah, this is when I decided the door needed to be higher, because I realized that Nancy um, would never fit. So I started to put her up here. And um, knocking back to the extreme distance, we've got some mountains. Really far. And, that's, yeah, the big old tree in the front. The Bob Ross bold tree that can, you know, we can move it around kind of wherever we want. So this is why it's nice to have things on separate layers. Um, 
but you know it's not a huge deal to to separate things into layers later because we're working at such a low resolution it doesn't take doesn't take much effort and that that's sort of um that's kind of a more polished version of where we're getting with the um with the uh this one which I'll start I'll show more of now now that we've kind of gotten that all out of the way but just for the people who have to go at nine I'm going to say thank you for coming. I'm going to keep doing this, by the way. But for people who have to go now, I'm going to say thanks for coming. Um, you know, check out the demo on Steam. I've got, I'll have, ooh, I can't see the links in the video description because that's not going to exist. Um, yeah, just go to the website, crimsondiamond.com. You can find everything that you would need there. Uh, the demo is on Steam, on itch.io, on Mac, and on PC. And um, I've got a YouTube channel where I post all this stuff. So there's already um, two music live streams with the musician with Dan Policar, who is or was in chat. And uh, so you can see what the musical process is, because what Dan is doing is he's using the Roland MT32, like a real Roland MT32, um, to to make the music. So that's gonna be that's super exciting. So seeing that technical aspect of it um, is really really cool. So I recommend if you want, you can go to um, my YouTube channel, which is just basically Julia Minamata, and watching some of that stuff. Um, you can watch the test stream where this is built, and then that's pretty much it. So whoever has to go, thank you so much for coming. I'm gonna keep working on the other piece that I have, and I do have some dithering examples um, to show people. Um, now, and now, because we're kind of, I kind of showed this part of it. Um, and yeah, we're gonna, if people want to stick around, please stick around. I'm gonna be here for a little while longer, I think, because I'm ashamed of the level of completion I got with the actual pixel painting and stuff. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. What else do we have? Just I'm gonna catch up on chat a little bit. Let's see. Um, talking more, making sure you're using black brown instead of brown black continuously. Idea of war. I'm not sure what you mean by that. I, I might have to, I don't know if I can go back more. Um, link YouTube. Okay. Um, I can link YouTube, I think. Give me a second. I can't believe I had the repeat button on. I told you we have to make every every mistake at least once. Okay. Oh, thank you, Dan. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have to scramble to do that. Okay, so here's an example of some of the dithering that um, I'm using in the game, some of the dithering techniques. But I'm going to show you some examples of dithering in other games. Dithering. Right, here. And also, um, I've got some forest examples because this is a forest after all. Okay, so this is Conquest of Camelot, which is an EGA game, one of the later EGA games that Sierra put out. Um, the art is by Peter Ledger. Nine o'clock. Yeah, it's nine o'clock in my neck of the woods. The Andrew Gray, your your mileage may vary. Thank you for coming, by the way. And hello, Ryan Warner Codes. Thanks for coming by. Um, yeah, I'm I'm keeping on. I know that you know, depending on how late people can stay. I just wanted to show at the beginning in the whole process, but then I'll get into I'll get into more of of uh, the painting as we go. But here we see some dithering. We see quite a bit of dithering actually, and some people um, some people have a problem with the dithering in this game. They feel like there's way too much dithering. And I partially feel like that they might have a case there, but at the same time, what I really like about all the dithering in Conquest of Camelot is that it reminds me of medieval tapestries. So, and I think that might have been the look they were going for. So I think it actually is very effective in uh, in producing this um, that feel of medieval tapestry. Cool, perfect. Um, yeah, I'm East Coast. I'm I'm Canada, Toronto, so. Good thing. Oh, 9 a.m. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, wow. 9 a.m. Okay. You definitely feel the voice overdone. I don't know. I kind of have a soft spot for it. Yeah. Uh, here's an example. You know, of someone doing a far scene. Another Peter Ledger. And what's interesting with this is uh, the what, what colors uh, he used for the grass. He used brown and bright 
in the bright uh, green. So it's, it's actually very high contrast. I feel like if he had used um, the dark green or something with that light green, it might not look as obvious in terms of dithering. It, it, it might um, be more kind of, um, you know, it might not be as uh, blatant in terms of dithering. Also, you can see the way that this is... The, way, the reason I say it kind of looks like a medieval tapestry is because up here in this area, we've got this flat um, black dither on this green shape, or vice versa. And it does kind of serve to flatten out those shapes, but I think that's also kind of maybe a medieval tapestry kind of effect. Um, so, I, I don't mind it actually. I think I think it actually is a nice uh, art. Maybe it's a nice artistic choice, and, and I'm 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 all in because it does look very different from a lot of the other stuff. And here is another example of Doug Herring's incredible dithering. So this is an EGA screen that people think EGA. They don't think they don't think this style. Of, uh, of art necessarily and there you know what here's the thing there is so much dithering in this screen there it, almost everything is like, the only thing that's not dithered on this screen is this area in the upper right corner and then this area here this puddle everything else is dithered so yeah except for the puddles but um it doesn't it doesn't uh it doesn't look like crazy over dithering although there is more dithering in this than probably the conquest of camelot piece i mean just a matter of how it's used and the colors that were used to dither because when you dither with two lower contrast from each other it's not going to look as obvious as this higher contrast area and i think um conquest of camelot uses a lot of high contrast in their dithering and yeah, DNA Beast says something to remember is these images were designed for cathode ray tubes rather than crisp retina displays, which is true. Like it would have blended, visually blended the colors more. And oh, and Roberta says Christy Marks actually worked on the artistic design for Con Conquest of Camelot. So yeah, it's perfect. So I know Christy Marks did a ton of research for the game, and I can see maybe she would have used, uh, possibly used medieval tapestries as a visual reference point. And I do agree with the idea of where I think that uh, Colonel's Bequest uses better lighting than uh, Conquest of Camelot. Oh, she just wrote for it. Okay, so she just wrote for it. Um, and here is an example of some of the dithering experiments I, I did for my own um, purposes. Are we just... are we... we're not repeating anymore. Okay, because there's just a lot of A songs. Okay. Okay, so here's an example of some dithering where you can get all kinds of really subtle effects based on the color combinations that you're using. And I do I do tend to gravitate toward um, the subtle the subtle ones like this this you can barely even tell that that this is dithered because these two colors are so close together. Uh, and I got new postcards printed and uh, there's quite a bit of the postcard that uses the dark cyan and the dark green dithered. And it's a little challenging for printers to reproduce that look, so it's very, very subtle. But then again, it's really subtle here too. Um, so I don't necessarily blame the printer for not being able to re reproduce it faithfully. It's just, it's it's the difference between these two colors is so slight that uh, that's what's good about it actually, is that it actually resolves itself to being kind of like a dim color because of that. And the same can kind of go for, I would say, the roof here. You can, yeah, I mean, it, depending on the two colors you're choosing to dither with, you can create something extremely subtle or very, um, not subtle. <laughs> okay, let's see. So, um, Pascal LaRue says, what determines two colors being close together? So, um, actually, um, for the colors, um, what I try to do with uh, some of the colors here is, uh, you know what? I also did another wrong thing, I'm just realizing. I just did another wrong thing. I didn't start recording. <laughs> this whole part, this is all um, not recorded, so I don't know what I'm going to do with that. That's a big oops, and hopefully that's a mistake I'm only going to make once. Okay, um, the tunnel part. So I tried to organize the... I tried to organize... Um, you know what? What the heck? I'm just going to start, <laughs> start recording now. Okay. Um... So I tried to organize these things tonally. So from lightest to darkest. Uh, Anna, thanks for coming by and enjoy dinner. And okay, so uh, anyone, if anyone can tell me how to get a video off of, download a video that you've made on Twitch off of Twitch, 
for your own purposes, that would be very, very helpful because now I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I don't have this recorded. Um, okay, so this is the sort of my, my attempt to scale these colors from light to dark. Yeah, Twitch does archive my streams, but it's only going to archive for 60, for 60 days. And actually, I'm lucky because it's an Amazon Prime, Twitch Prime perk. Usually they only go on for, for, for 14 days before they're kind of um, cleared off. But I, it, it will be on for 60. And Pascal, I'm going to take you up on that offer because I, I need this video. Pascal knows about getting Twitch video. Yikes! Yeah, I did say that I'll make every mistake once. Yeah, um, yeah, Dr. Mikachu, I just forgot to press the button. <laughs> okay, so, um, so when you look at this, now I actually saw a, a tweet recently about how when you press the desaturate button in Photoshop, it, do it doesn't necessarily give you an accurate value reading of what the colors are going to look like when you desaturate, but it's just to give you a vague um, you know, so this is this is just a very very rough just to give you an ex a, an example of what those colors look like when you take the color out. Um, this is not really necessarily by any means accurate, but you know, just to give you a look. Can you play the archive screen and screen capture that? Yeah, we'll find out. I'm not going to worry about it right now because it's it's uh, it's something we'll have to look at later. Um, okay, so yeah, so you can see here. This is sort of the, the value. So you can see that right in the middle here, almost indistinguishable, are these colors. So the, the green and the blue are very close. And then all these ones are kind of more close, and these ones are more close. So when you, if you were to dither these colors, and actually um, Quest for Glory 2 dithers um, the, the white and the yellow to great effect in the plaza in Shapir. Because just having a solid yellow in that area would really be overwhelming. Uh, an, an overwhelming amount of yellow, but dithering those two kind of softens them both up to give it sort of um, like a dustier color, and it's much easier on the eyes. Yes, Dr. Mikshu, I actually have a checklist too on, um, I, had a, I have a checklist uh, on here that I wrote of all the stuff I need to do, but of course uh, I forgot one. I, I, yeah, I don't even think I wrote that. Go live, confirm streaming, yeah, nope. I didn't put actually record on that list of, uh, but it will be next time. And thank you, Warbird Games. Yes, please, uh, please, yeah. Oh, real done. Okay, I like the sound of that. Okay. Anyway, so that that kind of this is like a rough guide of of the values and and which ones you can kind of dither together and not make them look as as um, as contrasty. But you know, I think the eye is really the best way to tell with those things. But uh, I would, what, what I was doing here is I was trying to come up with um, what I wanted nighttime to look like in the Crimson Diamond. Okay, next. <laughs> the Deluxe Tux says, my sister just walked into the room and now she's into Crimson Diamond. You really sold it up. Love it. Love it. This is this is why. Okay, there's a lot of reasons why I do this. Of course, that is one of the reasons why I do this. Is is to have people say, "Hey, I kind of like the way this looks. I'm gonna, I want, I want to, you know, help support, be a part of that." Okay, let's go back to this. Um, we'll put some foliage on those trees. I'm probably, you know what? I will go <laughs> hire Lux talks to the marketing department. Dan says, "Yeah." Um, so far, the all the departments are pretty small, and that most of them consist of me. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how long people are wanting to, to go on this, but I'll probably go for, I don't know. I don't know. Until like 9.45, half an hour on this specifically without showing any other examples. So I'm going to start with the middle tone. And what I'm just going to start doing is I'm going to just start, you know what? I'm going to start with the brighter one. We're going to start putting in some foliage, is what I call it. What's going on? Why is that color happening? It's weird. Do I have any? Oh, auto erase. It's auto erase is on. Make every mistake once. Okay. 
All right. Some scribbles. And so these are just to get the general shapes down. Um, I will if I go back in and define with light and shadow what this is all going to look like. And thank you guys for helping me like look into um, retrieving my video later. I'm so embarrassed. That is <laughs> worst. And then go ahead. <laughs> I thought you were, uh, the Diabor thought he was going to get more work done while watching this, but it's too fun. Well, thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. So, I said the light was coming from there, so we're going to. What's nice about this. <laughs> 320 by 200 resolution because it's, it's extremely forgiving. And every mistake that you make is fairly easily fixed. Let's go in with putting some, some nice shadow in. So what we do is, I, I do tend to start with the bigger, um, with the bigger brushes, and it's pretty clear that I do this in the intro graphics of my game, The Crimson Diamond, because uh, there's still, you can see kind of the very preliminary art in that game is, uh, it looks like MS Paint with like the biggest brush, because that's how I start. And that's how I start these. And uh, let's go into go into some of that here. The pencil right now is three pixels, Eden Wave. So not big, but compared to how big this is. And you know what? That's a good question. Can can Photoshop do custom sizes like two by one? So that sort of the AGI double wide pixel look. And I'm gonna go ahead and say I don't know. Um, I think I tried making a um, a brush like that, but then it, it doesn't end up staying in the right grid. If that makes any sense, like it'll it'll make um, the intermediate step. And yes, Legend of the Hand Sumatra Fate of Yandi is amazing. Sean Aitchison I met at Adventure X, and uh, he's really super cool. And he also uses Adventure Game Studio, which is the uh, engine I'm using to make my game. And DNA Beast's A Sprite has a function for that, and that's the third time in two days I've heard of. I mean, I've heard of A Sprite before, but I've got some friends who are really telling me that uh, I need to. I need to really get in on that because um, I use uh, Photoshop CS2 for everything, including including animation. Yeah, I was the, yeah Toma Castanav. I was yeah I was thinking of that actually. Um, uh, if I I was thinking about doing exactly that, like taking like a uh, the the 160 by 200 and then just stretching it after. I figured that that'll probably be that'll probably do the trick over anything else. Oops. Let's go back in here. 
But I haven't looked at it too much because I figure, you know, I'll have this plenty of time for me to figure that stuff out <laughs> when I make an AGI game, which is, I don't know when that is. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly, I'm gonna start showing, um, I'm going to start showing how to build a, a dithering mask in Photoshop. But first, I just think this tree needs a little something. And it's pretty straightforward. And the thing is, is it's kind of annoying to make them. But uh, you only really need to make them once. And then you can just kind of copy and duplicate as you need. So let's start with that. Although, you know what? Why don't we make um, more depth in this before we start in on that? I'm going to put in some of those bushes because uh, the bushes that I was showing you in the other piece, were, it's like some of my favorite things to do is the bush because I can make them like that beautiful dithered green. That's magic to me. Cool. Dithering? Okay, dithering's gonna happen. Let's do the dithering. I want to give this a little bit more depth before we get into that so there's something to dither. A Warbird uh, games you use Photoshop for the Han Solo pixel art, 256 color game. Yeah, I'm so... It's it's really hard and I see Dane Dino be saying A Sprite does some pretty neat things you didn't enjoy playing with, but it's often hard to bump out of your workflow. And I was yeah, totally about to mention that because uh, I've used uh, Photoshop CS2 every day for uh, fifteen years probably. However you know however long ago I was in college. Yeah. Um, so it's it is hard, but I have a friend, um, Miguel Sternberg of um, Steinberg, Sternberg, of Spooky Squid, who made uh, They Bleed Pixels, and he's, he made Russian Subway Dogs. And he said he used to do exactly the same thing as me, which is do the animation in um, Photoshop. But uh, he said Ace Bright will really help my workflow, so maybe, you know, that'll be a thing. Oh yeah, another thing about depth, we talked about size um, of shapes, and uh, I don't think we talked about proximity of shapes, so I'll talk about that. So... Let's say I was having, you know, putting some grass in here. This sprite is so good for animation, yeah. Oh, Astia, Astayonix. Hello, and thank you for being a fan. Thank you, it's it's really cool. How long have you been a game developer? He, he's a, our, Astayonix is asking. Um, how long did it take you to become a dev? Uh, yeah, that's just still... <laughs> becoming a dev is a work in progress. Um, so, I don't know. I, I can't really put a put a number on that. But however long I've been working on this, which is actually quite some time. I've been working on this game for probably on and off for maybe 10 years or so. But that's on and off, with an emphasis on off, because it'd be, there'd be a, like, long stretches where I wasn't working on it at all. Um, so I was mentioning... Um, uh, size and proximity as a way to show scale. And so an example would be there's grass in the foreground and that grass is pretty tall. But if I put grass in the background, I'll probably um, make the like my, make it a lot smaller and closer together because it would look closer together because it's further away. And you can't really tell there because those two colors are so close. Um, but, you know, here, like on this, the turn of the path, I'd make these much smaller here, like this, and closer together. And then as we get closer, this illusion of depth is created by making, you know, the grass much taller. Just a, just a shape that is recognizable somewhere else. If I repeat that shape but larger, it's just going to look bigger. Yes, Andrew Gray, size and texture depth cube. Perfect, exactly. Um, oh yeah, and so I said um, we're going to get into some some dithering but i feel like i need uh, one more layer of depth before i do that so why don't we add let's add another layer of depth like here maybe okay um, let's see okay <laughs> i'm so stoked to grab this grass <laughs> okay so uh, i'm gonna extend that um Oh, 
cover. Well, I feel like this is gonna be a problem. I'm trying to find a good place um, to put the continuation of this path without. No. No. I'll get to the I'm gonna get to the dithering real quick. Maybe put it back here. Like, I mean this is not a real path that like the player would never walk down here, but you know, we we want that illusion of possibility of like maybe they had. Okay, that'll do. Oh, cool. Yeah, Secret of Hutton Grammar School um, is an AGI style. Um, Tom Simpson. Tom Simpson, I also met at Adventure X, and he uh, made Feria Darls, which is another Adventure Game Studio game. And Eden Waith, who I'm not, I don't know if he's still on the chat, did the Mac port for that. So it's a whole... The community is awesome. Adventure Game community, there's nothing else like it. Okay. So we've got a bit of a... A bit of a path in the back, and we're gonna put. I'm gonna put. Put like a layer. Of far trees. Hey, yes, Eden Wraith, yes. Yes. Yeah, Tom Simpson, awesome. And the art of uh, Feria Darls is Matt Firth, who is an amazing pixel artist. Who also does beautiful watercolor sketches on his Twitter, so if you follow Matt Firth, you get to see some of that. Oops. Yeah, so I'm sorry, sometimes my fist goes over the camera. <laughs> I'll get a webcam eventually. Dan told me um, the model and stuff I should go for, but apparently everyone wants a webcam nowadays, so. Let's see. Well, thanks, Astayonix, Ast the, the video club with the Roland32 synth. Yes. What tools, people, or resources were instrumental in your dev learning progress? Uh, for dev stuff, for, for learning dev stuff, um, the Adventure Game Studio community, the forums, are um, fantastic. And I've been stuck and posted problems I've had there, and they were always super helpful and uh, helped me get through a lot of um, a lot of uh, sticking points in the development especially because um, I'm not I'm not a, like a, I don't have training as a coder I just um, I'm learning as I go and uh, having people be able to tell me how to do stuff when I couldn't do it myself having that uh, available as a resource is amazing and it's a very active community so got to say that helped um, also um, there is a YouTube um, tutorial and I don't know if it's still there but uh, Dens Ming D-E-N-S-M-I-N-G on YouTube he has a 40 part series on the, on the basics of Adventure Game Studio so if you have no programming background I definitely recommend his tutorials um, oh Matt was streaming earlier today sweet I gotta go follow him uh, I think at one point you've mentioned you got a lot of help from Dave Gilbert. Dave Gilbert, yeah, Dave. Dave is also an Adventure Game Studio developer, and um, and, uh, and obviously he publishes with Wadjet Eye Games. He's he's been around for a, like a long time, um, making and publishing games, and he's he's amazing. Uh, and Dave, yeah, I've I've actually gotten a lot of help from him just with stuff like. When I first started developing the Crimson Diamond, it was like an 8-bit game because 
Uh, that's what AGS Adventure Game Studio defaults to. They default to 8-bit. And when I told him that, his eyes just kind of got real wide. <laughs> and so um, he recommended that I make it not that. And so I did. And Dave... Um, uh, Dave also, he played a build of the game and offered a lot of really great feedback in terms of character and stuff like that. Dave, like, so helpful. Him and Francisco, so, like, awesome. Like, they're my heroes, basically. Yes, Warbird Games is the seconds the Densming tutorials, AGS tutorials. <sighs> yeah, Pixel Twitter, yeah, I just, yeah. I, I try to keep my, my, um, try to keep my Twitter feed full of positivity, and uh, adventure game devs seem to go for that. And the best way to code is to bash your head against the keyboard until it works. If it still doesn't, try again tomorrow and repeat. Pretty much. Pretty much. Oh, Dave is Dave Gilbert of Wadjet Eye Games. W A D J E T Games. They did the Blackwell games. They did, um, you know. Yeah, that Dave. <laughs> Which Dave? There's a lot of, probably there's a lot of adventure game Dave, not PV Dave. I don't know, maybe, probably PV Dave is really helpful too. I don't know. Uh, and another another thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get into the dithering real soon, but another thing to do is to show a bit of depth as well. What I can do is again we, when we talk about repetition of shapes, you know, just smaller, you know, just do less. Do a little smaller shapes. Little ones. Yes, why did I, Dave? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, and I was on a panel at um, at PAX East, um, the last the last uh, conference in history. Well, at least in 2020, at in Boston. And that was organized by Roberta Vaughn and uh, the Adventure Game, Classic Adventure Game Guild. Classic classic Gamers Guild, I'm so sorry. Yeah. And that was a lot of fun. And uh, also Ka Katie O'Hallahan Rahal was there of Phoenix Online Studios. And it was a great, it was a great um, panel. And it's up on my YouTube, actually, under Live Stuff. I think I've got a playlist called Live Stuff, and it's there. If you guys want to check it out. No. Get the idea. And what I would probably, you know, this was a three pixel wide brush, so what I would probably do is I'd go in and make these thinner because they're, they're further away. So they should be thinner. And. And also they kind of have these weird round tips because of the brush that I'm using. Ah, uh, Ben Chandler. Yeah, Ben Chandler has this great... Um, I would go to his website a lot and uh, he would break down adventure game um, backgrounds. And he is... yeah, he's an amazing artist. Okay, and just a few more trees over here. Now these ones are are um, they're closer than those back ones, but they're not as close as this one. So um, what I'm going to do to define that in depth is I'm just going to use bigger shapes, but I'm not I'm not going to do um, that brighter teal or cyan. And also, yeah, this can do that. Right. Okay. So let's get into making a dithering mask. 9.30. I said I'd go into 9.45. We'll see. However long you guys want to put up with this. Um, so let's start a dithering mask. I'm going to start with a yellow because it's just going to stand out. You can, Well, I, I change it to any other color after. And it starts off just like this. Oh, crap. <laughs> First it starts with making a new, la a new layer. And then it starts with making a checkerboard 
like this. And then it's it goes on to copying and pasting and merging the layers just like this. It's just, uh, you only need to do it once. <laughs> that is not the way. <laughs> no, no, this is not the way to do dithering. You know what? I'm glad you're here because uh, you can tell me the better way to do it. But <laughs> after. And I will, I'll start doing it that way. But like I said, like I only need to do this once. <laughs> and then that's it. Then I've never done this. I, I don't do this anymore because I just copy and paste this uh, layer. Oops. Is that the best way to do it in Photoshop? Um, I don't know. I just... It's the way I do it, and like I said, like after I've done it once, I just um, I just change the color of whatever to whatever I need, right? Um, so let's see, what color do I want for the dither? Well, I, I mentioned I love that uh, the dark green dither on the bushes to make them green, so I'm gonna do a dark green dither. And so what I do is. Make a layer mask, and then what you do is just copy, fill in the areas that you want, and fill. Like so. And sometimes, um, when you do this type of selection, you need to um, mask out parts that are part of a tree and not the bush. So then I go, I press Q, I go to Quick Mask, and I just Oops. Gotta make sure you're on the right. Give me a second. This uh, I'm, I'm finding the the, the um, it's chugging a little bit, so I don't know how if something's going slightly wrong. Sometimes, uh, if the computer chugs, it will stall out on a particular part. Okay. Uh, it's not. Oh, so Tomakas uh, Nav says, this is not? Is the, you, do you mean by it's not the way to do dithering in Photoshop? Uh, but like I said, yeah, it'd be awesome um, <laughs> to be told a better way. I'm open. I'm open to learning new things. Okay, <laughs> there's a three, it's a three-click process <laughs> in the Sprite. People are just selling me really hard on the Sprite. Maybe we do need to get you onto Sprite. Yeah, I look. Oh, there are shortcuts. Warbird game says. <laughs> ah. Yes. <laughs> well, no, I would say Eden rate that. Um, Photoshop and uh, and recording and streaming at the same time are pushing the limits of a, an eight-year-old Surface Pro 2. That's what I'd say. <laughs> what other part? Um, oh yeah, I like to do uh, a dark gray dither on um, on the in the in the back areas to knock it back a bit. So I'll do one of those. Yeah. Ah, you know what? Yeah, this might not be the best way to do it. But uh, hey, it's worked for me so far, and uh, I'm happy to learn of the better way. Okay. I know we all have like a. Um, a bit of a can always have a bit of a barrier learning new things. Um, I've always kind of said I don't like learning new things, but over the course of developing uh, this game, I've learned so much. And 
I'm glad that I have. Even though sometimes it's kind of annoying and frustrating. Like yesterday I was trying to cut a video, like cut the test video so I can put it up on YouTube. And uh, I found like a free like MKV cutter, but then I realized only until I had just done my cut that I wanted, uh, I said there was a watermark at the end, and I said, nope, that's not happening. Um, that was annoying. Come on, I'll boo. Yeah, I don't like learning new things, so I decided to learn programming. Uh, just, uh, just enough. Just enough to get by. Comfort quest. Cool. Oh, special guest appearance by uh, Francisco. Nice. Oh, see, the Deluxe Tux is learning like new things every day. Okay, thanks, Jen, for coming. I really appreciate it. Thanks for, thanks for hanging out. Yeah, uh, so the, yeah, sometimes this happens where I get sloppy with the selection, but you know, it's, it's all easily fixed. And sometimes I will go in um, pixel by pixel and just you know fix stuff as I need to. But at this point, mm -hmm. it's not the best, but. And actually, what I actually like doing is probably filling this part in as well with um, to knock those back even more. Thanks for linking the panel, Roberta. Have I played or heard of Residents? I have. I have heard of Residents. I haven't played it. Um, so I don't, I can't, like off the top of my head, I can't think of what, I can't remember what it looks like, and I haven't played it, but yeah, I've got a whole bunch of the games, um, in my GOG list, I just have to get around to them, GOG, I call it GOG, GOG list. Uh, Camulus, thank you so much for coming, it's good to see you, I always love seeing your work on Twitter, so I'll see, I'll see you there. And Francisco is always randomly popping up places. And 32-bit kid says, uh, programming is just a means to an end, and I totally agree. Oh yeah, and so with these bushes, what I, I do like, I do like, um, having, uh, the bright underneath here. So that's where you're gonna see this stuff. I don't know. I've heard, I don't know actually if people say GOG or GOG. I say. Now I can't. What did I say? I said GOG. 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 Now I can't remember what I said. <laughs> yeah, so Warbird. Yeah, this is a very similar um, uh, as doing the, the tonal dots, the tonal patterns on manga pages. And I have done that too, actually. Um, it's. Uh, with like the exacto knife and everything, um, it's a uh, it's a whole thing. I like the color of those. Yeah, it's a it's a whole, uh, and it's actually a, a quite a bit like um, it's quite a bit like uh, silk screen printing, which is what I used to do um, with my illustrations. I would. Um, I would. Uh, do like tonal dots to do to make you know intermediate colors. So there's a lot of carryover. So I kind of like the color of those, although that's not usually the color of the bushes I make, but I'm liking it. And then, you know you can add more on top of more. Um, and you know what? Let's do um, some of those long shadows that I like so much. Uh, I'm not painting on the layer mask. I either paint on top or underneath it. Those are just those just stay as uh, sort of checkerboards. Oh, hello, Amber Scene Zero. I haven't, I didn't see you come in, so hello, <laughs> and thanks for saying that you say Gog. Oh, cool. Oh, you worked on that game. Awesome. <laughs> Roberta says I'm not teaching summer camp. Uh oh. 
Okay. So the interesting, one of the interesting things is, yeah, when we have multiple, um, multiple shadows on top of other shadows. So I said the light was coming this way. So uh, let's put some shadows in. Wasn't the movie Meatballs recorded in Northern Ontario? I don't actually know, but I actually do know that um, that really uh, the scary movie The Vavitch was filmed in Northern Ontario. Um, what other movies are filmed in Ontario? Quite a few, actually. Uh, Shazam was filmed in um, Toronto. Bulletproof Monk with uh, Willem... What's his name? The guy in Goon. And... Uh, Lee Mubai from uh, Crushing Tiger. What's his name again? I'm drawing a blank. The Vavitch. Oh, and. What is there? Oh, yeah. I got distracted and I made this the wrong way. What's that guy's. What's, what's Lee Mubai's na real name? Yeah, you probably don't. This one. I actually, this side is the side I got distracted on and didn't do the right way. There. And then let's put a shadow on this side. Oops, see, and this is where we get into trouble because I kind of need this darker right now. Well, it's not in trouble, it's just actually kind of nice. Yeah, I'm, we're gonna, I figure, um, I'll go until. Go until 10. We'll say 10 and then call it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's not my best work, but, uh, you know. I also like just generally adding um, texture to the ground because it just looks like um, a golf course right now. So I'm going to go in and do some of that. <laughs> so Eden with you can see, or it was a D of War. Like, <laughs> just my, my, um, the layering of this stuff is just a mess. It's a mess. Yeah, it's tough to figure out when to use the crazy. Like when I see a crazy dithering um, combination, I, I, I'm in awe because I love that stuff. But I just. Yeah, you just, it's a, it's trial and error. It really is. Until you kind of figure out um, what combinations you kind of like, and then you can kind of um, have like little rules for yourself about how, what you're gonna, what's gonna do what. And I found that when I was doing the nighttime versions of, uh, of my screens, I would, um, I'd say, okay, well, now I know that I want the brown to become the dark cyan color, so that was easy, and then I would, you know, I'd have like little conversions for everything. Um, but there's there's always fine tuning. Oh. 
Well, Este Onyx, I'm glad that you find it inspiring to watch. I've been inspired by so many people. Like, yeah, I mean, Francisco and Dave, huge inspirations. Um, oh, yeah, there it is. I'm just having a bit of lag, so it's messing me up. Um, like, uh, I mentioned um, before on, uh, I think I mentioned it on the test stream, David P. Gray, who did the Hugo games, those shareware classics, EGA Adventure Games, text parser. He made those by himself for the most part, although I know he bought some of the art um, or hired someone for the third game. And uh, I, I am full of admiration for you know people who do it on their own or with a small team. So just seeing that, like seeing Francisco's like Ben Jordan games, and uh, seeing him go commercial after that, these were huge deals for me because you know you kind of get an idea of. Um, you know it's possible and uh... oh yeah and DNA Beast the Martian Ant selection I don't really mind it actually it kind of just uh, it reminds me of, of what is uh, being selected so is it under like preferences potentially And let's see, um, Warbird Game says, I have it easy with Han Solo because it was a VGA effect. You just crunched the palette using the pattern dither, <laughs> replicating EGA. Yeah, it's eh, like it's, it's trial and error and figuring out what works for you, what doesn't work for you. Um, yeah, you have to do, yeah, you do have to do it by hand. That's what, that's, that's what I love about it is that it, um, it's actually, you know, when you look at it, you can, you, you know, you can be amazed. But when you look closer, you can see exactly, you know, what 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 was done to achieve the effect. But at the same time, someone who came up with that and executed it and saw it in a way before, you know, before it actually existed, before it was there. It's kind of amazing. Oh, view show selection. Let me try it. Okay, let me try it. <laughs> okay. Uh, view. Oh, extras. It's like under extras. Show. Uh, selection edges. Layer edges. Like Yeah, here, here it is. Oh. I don't know. Um, it was a ghosted out for me, so... Ah, selection edges. There. Oh, see, there you go. Yeah, I'm scared now because I don't know what I selected. But no, it's good to know. I see. I learned something new. I've been using this program every day for 15 years, and I learned something new today. That's cool. <laughs> what? There's a VGA loom. The Dio Boy says. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I have my biases, obviously, and uh, I just want that. EGA loom to be more easily available. So this is another example of again like with the, the, the grass, you can make bigger grass and you can make littler grass over here. Um, Paolo Quattroti asks, how, how do I determine when to use dithering and when to use pure color? Yeah, I, I know someone earlier in the chat was saying, oh, um, oops, they were saying uh, like in the daytime it's probably easier because you can use less dithering. Um, I don't know. I kind of it's it's hard to find the balance. I don't like using too much just solid color. I don't tend to do it a, a lot. Like huge vast areas of of just bright color are kind of a bit much much to handle and it can end up looking really cartoony. So I don't I don't tend to. Um, but then again, of course, if it's too much if it's got too much um uh, dithering then it can look kind of nuts. Oh, CKR Tech, I didn't see you coming either. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I agree. The difference in Lumi GA and VGA is worth its own video. Yeah, there, there's some beautiful water effects. Um, I really am a fan of the water effects, like in uh, Quest of Glory 1, the Flying Falls. I think it looks great. 
Here's another example of creating some depth is the grooves here in this path. If I start breaking them up more and then less as we get here, then that can also give this illusion that there's depth. And another thing, so this is what happens when you start going really going in here. Um, what I can do is if I take off that this here and what I can do is select this part, turn this back on and everywhere the the tree shadow overlaps the rut in the road, I can make that black. And it, it's not going to be something you're going to notice too clearly. Um, but it's something that's very subtle and when it breaks up that perfect dither it can really um, it's a subtle way to show dimension. So you can see that shadow as it crossed over. And that's what I mean by combining shadows in EGA is like a magical illusion because you get this beautiful overlap that's very subtle um, where that rut happens. Oh, control H hides the selection. Yes. Something I vaguely remember. Yes, yes, DNA beast. Yeah, I figured out I had to have it selected first and then hide, but then control H will do it too. So let's do that again. H. Oh, no. Oh yeah, there it goes. Yep, control H will hide on the fly. That's actually, so I learned two new things today. What else can we do? Okay, we're coming in five, so five minutes left. Um, what else can I do real quick on this? Oh yeah, here's another example of a place where... Um, yeah, I'm chugging a little, I can tell because uh, oh you know what maybe it's this you see that's another thing is that when i turned the selection edges off i couldn't tell that i had a different area selected so i thought um my computer was chugging but it was just uh because i had selected the wrong thing so another reason to keep selection edges on i think i'm pro selection edges because sometimes you know you go in with a brush and you're like why isn't anything happening did i break my photoshop and then you realize oh i've got a, an area selected i didn't know i had so here's another example of that extension. I do this in the, the uh, test stream, just kind of extending those these lines to make it look like a shadow is being cast when it's just uh, a 32-bit kid. Thank you so much for coming. I, like I'm, a, you know, I'm a big fan of your Twitter. Um, I love that process of seeing how the draws did happen in the games because you just marvel at some of those the number of steps some of those took, especially from that tree from Conquest of Camelot, my goodness. So uh, you keep up the good work and, and you're an inspiration too. So thanks for coming by. Uh, oh yeah, I realized that this shadow wouldn't be here. That's kind of... not Well, not as much anyway, right? This, this, the light's coming from that other direction. It still would be there a bit. Carry this all the way up. And, uh, this is a cut, so we can. Yeah, and then you know what? Sometimes the nice part of this is when you go in and you start going into that one by one pixel brush and you really start getting in there. You know, just zoom all the way in and just get your face in the pixels. Take us, you know. Make everything as perfect as you want it to be. So it's the broad strokes that um, that don't take very much time, but of course it's the refinement. It's what takes forever. And of course it's always with um, the player experience in mind about leading people to the right areas and uh, creating that setting. Oh, you know what? I forgot to show. I'll show one last set of uh, images and then I will call it a day. Take care, 32-bit kid. Um, yeah, so I actually forgot to show one last set of images. So I'll do that right now right, in the last couple minutes and then we'll call it a day. Um, so I did have some different examples of forests and some of them we'd already seen. Let's just look at them all. So this is Quest for Glory 1 again. 
And what I like to, to show with these is how different different artists approach these things. Like these are brown trees. I, I like gray bark for some reason. I in here we have some gray bark. Dark, dark red trees in Conquest of Camelot. This is green gray trees. How um, different artists can do different things. Where's the Larry one? Oh yeah, this is Hugo's House of Horror, uh, Hugo 3, The Jungle Adventure. And how different artists approach the same problem of creating a forest uh, scene. Maybe I'll, um, you know, work on this more and uh, share on Twitter the fully developed piece. Here's a jungle in Larry 3. And... Uh, how that all gets worked out. Loom again, we, sh we showed the same piece last time. And uh, this, like this stuff in here, like these, these trees, just, you know, I need to shake my head. Look at all the different colors that are in there. That's amazing. And then Crush of Glory, uh, King's Crush 4. This is an example of showing that depth again, where we have the front, the central focus stuff. Then when you set the next grove of trees back, it's just the dark green, not the light green. Further back, it becomes blue. And then you've got these other dark trees. So it's that creation of this beautiful sense of depth. Um, and this is not um, actual EG EGA. It's been color shifted or something happened, but this game was an EGA. Just another example. And there's beautiful reflections in that water too. There was no water in this piece, but you know. It's always nice to look. All right. Um, yeah, Loom is amazing. I'm just gonna catch up on this. Yeah, Warbird Games. You make one thing too perfect, and you gotta go over all the rest. Yeah, Hugo has three. There's Jungle Adventure is the third one. Hugo's Who Done It is the second one, and Hugo's House of Horrors is the one everyone knows. And that's the first one. Um, Oh, thanks, DNA Beast, for saying that uh, you like seeing the workflow. I, I, I'm happy to show it. And like I said, I'm happy to learn new things. Um, this, well, not completely new things like video editing, which is an awful thing, especially when you've got a Surface Pro 2. But uh, new stuff specific to, you know, the what I'm already doing. And a sprite is something I, I maybe will look eventually into. And uh, <laughs> Leisure Suit Larry Games talking to Mikachu, you're not alone. Uh, I think I think a lot of kids uh, got into those earlier than our parents would have liked. Um, but yeah, maybe you know, maybe at some point I'll 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 work this up a bit more um, into something more final looking, and then I have to write a part in the game now that incorporates an outhouse. I don't know. I'm tempted now. Um, okay, uh, so now we're at ten. Um, I'm gonna call it. But uh, before you guys go, uh, just a quick reminder of. Um, you know, anyone who missed it, um, my my YouTube will be I'll be posting this when I <laughs> when I figure out how to get the video off of of Twitch. Um, I will put it on YouTube, and uh, yeah, please um, you know follow me on Twitch um, so you know when these go live. Um, Twitter, all my social media stuff is on the crimsondiamond.com. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming and making this like such a fun time. Um, it wasn't perfect, but you know, first uh, first try, not too bad. Um, <laughs> the pinnacle of outhouse jokes from Gold Rush. <laughs> well, anyway, um, I'm gonna call it, you guys. Um, let me just get into OBS again. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for coming. This was this was an experience, and. Uh, I hope to do more in the future. I'm hoping to do maybe an interior piece to show you what that would be like. Um, and maybe some like people stuff, like the close up. I have some close up cutscenes, and maybe people would like to see how those are done and how that's approached by other games. Um, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you guys for coming and hope to see you again uh, soon. All right, good night.